Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zerrell. I mean, who wants to have sex with a guy named Bob? Oh, Bob. <laughs> Just doesn't sound right. Oh, Bob. Bob. Oh, Bob. Oh, Bob. 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 With me, as always, is professional film critic Sean Patrick. I am the smart. I am the smart. S-M-R-T. I mean, S-M-A-R-T. And Josh Adams. You goddamn communist heathen, you had best sound off that you love the Virgin Mary. Or I'm going to stomp your guts out. Now, you do love the Virgin Mary, don't you? Visit us at IHateCritics.net, IHateCritics.com, Everyone's a Critic, MoviePodcast.com, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our handle is CriticsPod. Follow us, like us, friend us, whatever it is you do at those spots for the trailers, the top fives, the 1988 movies. Sean's in writing a review a day, and a lot of times he shares those there as well. Plus, you can interact with us on there as well. Or invite us to be on your podcast. Sometimes that happens once. Uh, we're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, all your podcatchers. Uh, please go to Apple Podcasts, though. Subscribe to the show. Write and review the show. And we'll read your review on the air. We haven't had one in a while, and it's nice to kind of get back in the charts there as well. And then Patreon. I hate critics.net slash Patreon. We just put out the early release of the time travel episode. You're all going to get it because uh, we Josh specifically spent a lot of time putting that together. But the Patreon, patrons are going to get it first, and they're going to – it's almost two hours long. So it's up there now for the Patreon supporters. Also, I got all the merch in that I'm ready to start sending out to our Patreon supporters. So if you could – I'll start reaching out to you guys individually to get addresses to send you new mugs – uh, new bumper stickers. They got magnets now. Um, sending out. I do think the thongs were unnecessary. Yeah, but I don't know. You don't like thongs. I mean, it looks good on Josh. Every once in a while, you just want an, a buddy <laughs> cupping your butthole. <laughs> and uh, if you can't have one, then you need a thong. I, I think you're on your own on this show. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> See, now i got to go get thong. So you're like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I want an Everyone's a Critic podcast thong. <laughs> this is what happens Cause, when you spend an hour cause, plus cause now breaking we're a, down a noir movie. Because now we're a morning zoo radio show. <laughs> Full disclosure, I did one time make an I Hate Everyone's a Critic podcast thong. <laughs> It was a piece of crap, so I threw it away. But I just wanted to see what it looked like when I got here. <laughs> oh, anyway, uh, we're, uh, I think we're ready to start the show. <laughs> sure. So, uh, trailers. We'll start with one that Josh wants to talk about, How to Train Your Dragon, something or other. How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World. Thank you. I'll only spend a very brief time talking about this. We never mention animated films unless it happens to be Pixar, for the most part. And this series, though, has been really fantastic. I mean, the first movie's one of the best animated movies I've ever seen. The second one really doesn't miss a beat. Uh, in this trailer for the third one, it was just very emotional. And, and I'm very susceptible to that kind of thing, of course. But when it comes to this these particular movies, it's like they're going for broke on emotion. And I'm okay with that. It, it's almost like there's too much uh, sugar in animation these days. And... Getting back to a time when animation was a bit more inspiring and a bit more like, wow, that seems more like a movie than something that's been drawn or rendered. Uh, I, I really appreciate this series, and it looks like they've put all of their chips on the table for this. It doesn't come out until, I think, March of next year, and that would be almost a five-year gap in between movies. It, that doesn't really happen with animation at all. You know, They're, They really took their time with this. The people involved really care about their, the material, and I'm invested in it as a result. I, I think I like this. I don't remember if I like this <laughs> franchise or not. I think I do. You've, you've praised it before. Okay, yeah. good. Because uh, <laughs> it doesn't obviously it hasn't stuck with me, but uh, I was not blown away by this trailer. It looks, this looks like a very familiar story to me. Unfortunately, most of the time, you know, when you follow a narrative with sequels, everyone's got to get married and then everyone's got to have kids or whatnot. You've got to finish the story at some point. 
I get that. That part is a little formulaic, but I think they've even identified in the trailer the epic conclusion, and they're identifying this friendship between the two that's really changed the world, and and that that's just cool. Yeah, I like the first one. Never saw the second one, and I, if I remember, I mean, the, it's just kind of more real than a lot of the other animated. And I mean, there's dragons in it, so it's not. But it's <laughs> right. like, you know, they're not afraid of death and that kind of. <laughs> Thing. Indeed, and losing limbs, etc. <laughs> right. And then Captain Marvel that dropped this week. Yeah, I'm I'm interested. I'm in. I like Brie Larson a lot, so I mean that that wins me over a great deal. Uh, so I'll, I'll pretty much follow her straight into hell. <laughs> <laughs> I I think it's a good looking trailer. I was excited to finally see some footage from it, other than just some random photos and whatnot. You know who the villain for this one is, Sean? No. Ben Mendelsohn. Oh, no. wow. <laughs> now, we finally now answered 50, the question. 50 people might know who he is now. <laughs> yeah, but like half the movie, he's going to be shapeshifted into a, a Cree or a scroll or whatever. I think it's a oh, scroll. So never mind then. It's yeah. basically a nameless f- villain. <laughs> <laughs> but he actually plays the head of S.H.I.E.L.D. as his human form. So we are going to see Ben Mendelsohn. And seeing Samuel Jackson de-aged and whatnot and without his eye patch as Nick Fury is kind of neat. Uh, I Seeing Blockbuster Video show up in this trailer to remind us that, hey, this is set in the 90s. You guys remember video stores, right? <laughs> It sounds like it's a cool idea. I was trying to explain this at home by saying, well, it's not a prequel, but it kind of is because it's set in the 90s. And then she reminded me, no, this isn't the first Marvel movie. What about Captain America, the first Avenger? I'm like, oh, crap, you're right. That was set in World (laughs) War II. I'm an idiot. And it seems like they're trying to protect themselves and the fact that she hasn't been in any of these movies prior but was around in the 90s. So they're they're trying to... it looks like they're trying to make take the steps to cover that up properly yeah, without yeah. you being too annoyed. She was off world, right? Probably, but I don't know. I I am getting sicker and sicker of the superhero movies. As much as I like Brie Larson, uh, it's it. I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm going to keep going after this next Avenger movie. We'll see. You know the the thing about it too, though. It's directed by. S- two directors, Anna and Ryan Fleck, and Anna Bowden, I think is her name, and they've done some really smaller stuff. Mississippi Grind is probably where they got Ben Mendelsohn from, but also uh, Half Nelson. And they've, they've done smaller stuff, and to have Captain Marvel be this project of theirs, this is like really going from a $5 million to you know, $100, $150 million budget. It seems to me like it's important to remember that going into this film, that they're not an already bred, you know, Hollywood style team of directors. Right, but you can't use that as a crutch either. Or you can't, I don't know. It's, Indeed. I, I get what you're saying. I would hope it's a little more grounded as a result. That would be nice. Uh, let's just jump right into our new movies then and start with the most successful one this week. Eli Ross, the house with a clock in its wall. You just love putting his name up front, don't you? Because they will not put his name on this movie in any advertisement, and I think that's hilarious. It is kind of funny. Because uh, I mean, I, until like the day before, I didn't realize that. Was, I thought maybe he was a producer, and then, like, no, you, you told me that he was the director of this movie. I've known this since, like, Thor came out, because the, he was posting... Instagram videos of like Jack Black and Kate Blanchett arguing over the immigrant song because I think Jack Black was the first one to get Led Zeppelin to use the immigrant song in a movie <laughs> for School of Rock and then Thor did it too and they were having some immigrant song battle and I was like what the hell is Kate Blanchett doing in a movie with Eli Roth <laughs> and then the trailer comes out and his name's nowhere to be found in any of them <laughs> they tried to hide it for sure because you know he doesn't have a great reputation uh, deservedly so <laughs> But uh, this is it, is it pains me to say it. This is this is a good movie. <laughs> this is a good movie. Um, I like this movie. Uh, the idea here is that uh, there's a young boy who's going to live with his uncle after his parents have been killed. Uh, his uncle is a, a weirdo. He's a strange guy. Jack Black in full Jack Black mode in that Jack Black kind of way that we always want him to be, but lately he hasn't been, and now he is that. Uh, Highly caffeinated, out of control, wacky Jack Black again, and I, I 
kind of it felt fresh again to me honestly uh, I, I liked seeing him be all weird and fun again uh, and he, him and Kate Blanchett are a lot of fun together they're both she's a, a witch who's kind of lost her powers he's a warlock who's got you know crazy weird powers and they're trying to find this clock that's inside this old house that happens to be a doomsday clock that is cl- counting down to basically the end of the universe uh, and the young boy is the key to finding it and you know, it's a very simple story, but I thought it was played out in a very colorful fashion. And I like the way that uh, Eli Roth's horror influences come into play here, because he's making essentially kind of a child's horror movie. And I kind of, I have to admit, I did dig the way he worked that in there. The horror stuff that he chooses is smart, and it's safe for kids. At the same time, I could see it genuinely giving them a thrill or a scare. And I, I really did appreciate the way he did that. Uh, this movie uh, is not getting great reviews, and I think, I don't know why that, I think that's just kind of maybe a bias against him, a bias against Jack, probably, too. <laughs> There's probably a, a hatred out there for both it's like of their right around 70% their on Rotten Tomatoes, yeah. though. That's not great, but it's not horrible. Not horrible. It was at 61 for much of the week, so I thought maybe, I didn't realize it had gone up. When I, I saw it this morning, and at that point it was, I think it was sixty eight or sixty nine. But I, I I enjoyed most of this movie, and I thought the production design was pretty spectacular as well. The special effects aren't great, but in terms of the design, the house is pretty spectacular. I loved the bit with the changing uh, uh, stained glass window. I thought that was really clever, especially the the graves. <laughs> that one was really fantastic. <laughs> and the Jack Black trying to hide it from the kid. I thought that was a really clever bit. And I loved the way it kept kept recurring. Uh, you know, the the chair that they stole from Pee Wee Herman, not so much, but <laughs> I, you know, it wasn't terrible. Uh, uh, so overall, yeah, I, I really like this movie, and I do recommend it. I think that it's definitely watchable. Uh, it's shy of good for me. It's shy of something that I can recommend as as a good movie, and really, it's what I saw out of it that didn't quite work is the direction and the editing of this one where there are some times where it builds and then it slows back down and it builds and then it slows back down. And there's something wrong with the pacing to the point where there's size on either side of me yawning on either side of me and myself, I'm starting to drift a little bit and then it maybe it has something to do with the theater Whatever the case may be, I wasn't drawn to the film the entire time, and I wish I was because I like the leads so much in this. Uh, Jack Black and Kate Blanchett have a really good chemistry with each other. They they play off of each other well with all of their little bits, and they don't have to get too far into wizarding uh, tropes to make us understand that they have some powers. Okay, I, I bought everything that they were doing. It it didn't go too childlike to to resemble something like Goosebumps, and it also wasn't too harsh to be like a Crimson Peak, you know? Um, the, the horror notes that you're speaking of, I actually was down with that too. The Book of the Dead and, and, and the zombie hand kind of coming out or whatever and referencing um, blood magic in Azazel, for crying out loud. I'm like, oh, we're getting a little far here, but... It, it, that part worked. It just has to do more with the pacing of the film and, and, and how I wasn't engaged the entire time. I, I don't hold it against Eli Roth. I was waiting for this one to really excite me. But unfortunately, it hasn't stuck with uh, any any of the party that I went with. Yeah, the theater I was in, it was pretty... They seemed pretty invested in it. A lot of laughing, a lot of you know reacting. So I don't... I mean, maybe it just depends on who was in there. I mean, I know my kid was there when you were there. So. Yeah, indeed. I happened to see Bob's two kids in front of me and met Bob's parents. <laughs> no, no. Are there... Those are my in-laws that I cannot those are your stand. Those in-laws. <laughs> not, I am sorry. I thought that perhaps they were your parents. It's <laughs> because he shaved his head because I did? Yeah, fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops! I'm just kidding. He ain't That's, listening, and if he I, is, it doesn't matter. I can't, I can't judge the audience in mind because I saw it in the IMAX, and uh, and it was mostly empty on a Thursday night IMAX show. I uh, so I really didn't see much of the audience reaction. I just had kind of had my own reaction to it to go by, and I I did enjoy it. I also got to see uh, Thriller in 3D with oh. this, so that was kind of cool too. How long did that last? Out of curiosity, um, yeah, just 15 minutes. Okay, I wasn't sure if it was some kind of extended extended version or no. It was just the original Thriller as you remember it from TV, but in 3D. That's 
That's cool. But I mean, Michael Jackson uh, thriller on IMAX speakers. That's pretty awesome. And blown up to that IMAX size. That was really cool. Yeah. And uh, I got I got to see one of the one of the managers, one of the young kids, jump out of his skin <laughs> the first time he, Michael Jackson started turning into a, a wolf. That was really? great. That's cool. well, the first time I ever got scared shitless by watching something on TV was the thriller video. And at the end, when Michael turns back at the camera and his eyes are green, I hid behind the TV for like 20 <laughs> minutes. And my parents had to pull the TV out to get me out. That's how scared I was. What scared me on MTV was Twisted Sister. We're not going to do that. Like, I would start crying. And my parents had to tell my babysitter to stop watching MTV when I was she was babysitting. The weirdest thing that's ever scared me on TV is Alan Thick. Yeah, he had a show called Thick of the Night back in the day. It was his talk show. And he did this bit where he used aging makeup and I thought he was dying. <laughs> like I thought, "Oh my god, how is Alan Thick this old? He's dying. Oh my god, he's dying right before our eyes." Oh, we're all dying before our eyes, I guess. But yeah. But no, I like the house uh, clock in its walls. Uh, I I didn't really have a problem with the direction or the pacing, but again, I mean, I think sometimes the environment can affect that. Sometimes it's a movie, but maybe I need to see it again. But it definitely seemed for kids more so than adults. Uh, it, there wasn't a lot of the fun stuff that adults can enjoy with it. It was mm-hmm. definitely more geared towards kids. But I, I was... I'm someone who likes Eli Roth without really liking any of his movies aside from Cabin Fever, and I only like that because it, it's a small little indie movie he made, and I saw it when it came out way back when. It doesn't hold up as much now when you put it on you know, the same pit level as a studio movie. But I haven't liked anything else he's done, and I've tried to figure out why. Because then you go and watch him in interviews, he's the most likable guy in the world. Everybody in Hollywood apparently loves him. Steven Spielberg hired him to make this movie. Quentin Tarantino does every, you know. Huh. So he seems to be a really likable guy, but I think his problem is he's too much of a fan. And but like Scorsese is too, but he, I don't know if he, Scorsese is a fan of the right era, <laughs> and then he brings it. And well, Eli Roth's a fan of like that late seventies, early eighties kind of underground B horror, B comedies, and he throws all of it in all his movies. And now this time he finally has like a real budget. He's got Steven Spielberg saying, "Don't do this, do this," you know. And then he's got Jack Black and Kate Blanchett, who their chemistry is fantastic in this movie. He's never really had a good actor in any of his movies. That's true. And I don't think he made Keanu Reeves worse. I don't think Keanu Reeves was that great. I think he can be made good by good directors. But on his own, I don't think he's that good. And Bruce Willis, same thing. Oh, absolutely. Those are the two most famous guys he's had in movies. Everybody else has just been kind of nobodies. So he's a, a lot of his problems in his movies is his acting. And so now he's got a real budget, a real studio. And... I, this is the type of movie he should be making, I think, and he needs someone to ground him. He can't have control like he has in his other movies because when he has control, he just throws a kitchen sink at it. But when he has someone kind of directing, him, saying, "This is here's your budget, here's this, you know, here, here's the leash, work within <laughs> these parameters," I think he does a better job because a Death Wish was probably his second best directed movie, as bad as that was. <laughs> but I mean. If you think about it, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's so, reasonable. Uh, when you're, com- I mean, you're comparing that to two hostile movies in Cabin Fever, yeah, yeah, I would well, say Cabin so. Fever is fine. It's a small little indie movie. That's, you know, I think the big problem there is putting that up against, you know, a studio horror movie. Hostile, hostile should be good. That is a good idea. That is just trying to throw Porky's into the mix. You know, that type of a, like a Porky's comedy mixed with some fucked up horror movie and it just and it's also of a time though where horror filmmaking was at a point where they kept making movies about terrible people that you're not supposed to care about and it was at that time when it was just just post freddy where you know like like we're we're trying to take horror seriously but we're also still not delivering characters that you care about well and to me i guess i don't care about that i think that's a f- fault on the critics and the people who don't like that that's on them not so much the direction because they're not trying to make characters you like so no but you have to have a character no, you don't you that's do have a character the... that you identify with or something no you don't <laughs> tell me give me a good movie that has no characters that are that are the through line that somebody you can follow or something i mean we just especially when you're when you're when especially when you're making a movie like this and these you've got these three horrible characters like are you supposed to want them to die 
Well, that's, I mean, I'll tell you right now, I think The Devil's Rejects is a good movie. There's no one likable there. And that's, just, you know, we're just going to disagree on that. But that's, I think that's just more of a fault on the critics who say there's no, or, you know, they're, they want a rule. They want to make rules on a movie or a type of movie. And they're not following your rules. So you're not going to like it. And that's just more of a, an agree to disagree type of thing rather than saying it's a fault. It's just something you don't like going into it. I mean, it's they clearly aren't trying to make likable characters in it, so I don't think it's a... <laughs> well, then what are you supposed to enjoy about the movie, then? The horror part of it, the darkness of it. I, I don't know. Some people are into that type of... It, it's, it clearly has audiences. I mean, even Hostel has its audience, and people love that movie. I I just, w- yeah, I would even say uh, Godfather. Uh, any kind of mob type movie where most of the people are doing nefarious things, they're all criminals, they're all part of the same lifestyle, no matter what honor they want to you know, pervade to you on the screen, I think they're all kind of crappy people. Well, I'm going to at least identify that. But there are a lot of conflicting and, emotions in that, though. Yes, and, but at their base, like crappy people that I don't care for at all. I, I don't care for anyone in those, they're just well made. And uh, so, therefore, I'll go for for that. And most of the people that I know, including you guys, think that kind of stuff is generally really good uh, because of it. it's compelling. I think that you can have unlikable characters provided that, that it's compelling. Um, even if the characters are doing bad things to each other, it's like, it, it, as long as it's something that hooks you, then, then okay. I think the problem with Eli Roth stuff is it just hasn't compelled me <laughs> up until now, especially like the Green Inferno, because I was actually kind right. of excited for that Well, one. he's a terrible acting. I mean, like for me, I think I'm the type of person that would like someone, something like Hostel. I just don't think he executed it well enough. Uh just, I mean, I because I don't, I don't mind the fact that no one's likable there, but the that's acting's not my only movies. problem with it. It's a, it's a shitty movie, just right? Overall. Well, that's what I'm getting at. Too. I agree. The acting's terrible. The, he's the pacing is. You literally the first half of that movie is a t- TNA comedy. I mean, it's and not a very good one. Well, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but then it just kind of switches on you, and that isn't bad. It's just you knew going in this was a really torture porn, dark horror movie, so you're not tricking the audience you know make the commercial about a tna comedy and then switch it on them in the theater and then at least they did something daring instead you just gave us the tna comedy that no one cared about i, I don't know but I, I just think he works better with one good actors it's it is weird to see he can't really screw up jack black and kate blanchett not really even no. in bad jack black <laughs> movies jack black's usually jack black uh, and Kate Blanchett's always yeah. good. I'll give you also the credit that not that you're you. representing Eli awesome. Roth here, <laughs> but uh, this <laughs> this does look like a professional film. You know, uh, despite my problems with with pacing, it it looks like it should be the most successful film this weekend. I didn't have a problem with CGI, for example, which uh, I, out of someone like him, I thought maybe this is going to look kind of cheap. It doesn't. And, and I agree with you. This is the type of thing that he should work on. Hone your craft in uh, projects like this that have a darker aspect to them or whatnot, or an undertone of something. You can even insert a demon here and there. <laughs> that, the demon that the, 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 the Kyle McLaughlin goes to in this film, that's a creepy looking demon, yeah. man. Like that, That's more effective than crap in The Exorcist to me. Like, whoo, ugh. Yeah. yeah, keep doing that. And, and stop writing your own movies because he's not a good writer either. <laughs> yeah, that's another He problem. didn't write this one. Or adapt or, it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I don't know. I'm glad to see him doing well. It looks like it's going to be a profitable movie. And yeah, I, I, I will say that my in laws didn't really care for it. Uh, but I, again, I think it's more for kids than adults. Uh, Fahrenheit 11.9. Uh, Michael Moore's uh, latest documentary, uh, people assume it's a takedown of Trump, and it kind of, like, it has elements of, like, it. he certainly doesn't care for Trump, but at the same time, he was the one who said he was going to get elected. Michael Moore said that. All along. All along. <laughs> he kept telling people that, uh, and he doesn't shy away from that, and he's, uh, this is this is him not, he's just kind of throwing attacks on all, on all sides, really, in this one, which is interesting for him. Um, much of it is about Flint uh, and caring about the Flint water crisis and going after uh, 
Governor Snyder, who deserves to be gone after. That guy is a slimy son of a bitch. He basically switched the water of from Lake Huron to the Flint uh, River, and the Flint River has long been highly polluted, and everybody knew that. But there was no ma- there was no way to make money off of the off of getting water out of Lake Huron. Nobody owns that. Nobody owns that one. So nobody owns those pipes. Nobody can build new pipes. It's all there already. <laughs> so you can't make money that way. But you can make money by building new pipes and giving a and giving a private contract to a friend. Uh, you can do that. And so that's what he does. And nearly poisons and and murders hundreds of thousands of people who. Not you know happen to be low income people, mostly African American. It's all bad. It's just all bad, and he's just a horrible person. And on top of that, he tried to cover it all up by creating a brand new law in which he removed the city government from Detroit, from Flint, and from two other cities in Michigan that could have blown the whistle on him. That could have could have continuously pointed out what he was doing. He removed them and put people in place, his cronies in place, to help him keep covering this up. And that's why this thing continues to this day. They have no local government in Flint. They don't have a choice. They don't get to vote for their own mayor in Flint right now. That's in America. That's happening right now. That's messed up. And I'm glad that this movie is more about that than it is about anything else. Because really, I mean, going after Trump is pretty much of a waste of time at this point. He's all, he's a, he's his own tire fire. And, uh, you know, and the points that he makes about the Democratic Party and going after them as he does is, is, are very, you know, very pointed, very specific. And, and you know, yeah, you're, you're not wrong. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, the movie is extraordinarily depressing. You come out of it, you're just very, very sad. And that's really the kind of the effect. Whereas, you know, at least at least Fahrenheit 9/11 had a lot of laughs to it. He was definitely having having fun at the expense of the Bushes. Whereas here, he's not having any fun at all. Other than uh, he, at one point, he takes some Flint water and he goes to uh, the governor's mansion and uh, sprays the water all over the over all over his lawn, which I thought was at least that was at least having him having a little bit of the kind of fun that he used to have. Can you go see it, John? Mm. No, but I think uh, what you've identified is when you get activists or filmmakers that try and make a difference that can only focus on like, well, this just sucks, then you're like a really bad moment. (laughs) You can't even inspire change. You just feel shitty about things, it seems. And uh, I I guess I just have to turn on the internet (laughs) and and feel the same way that Michael Moore does. Well, he's gotten to the – I mean – He's kind of become like the left wing's Ted Nugent, or what you know that they've whether it's warranted or not. That's kind of where he is to the point where no one even listens to him anymore. Even the left, you know, he was out there kind of all alone saying he's gonna win. He's been he'd said that for almost a year and a half before the election even happened, and nobody listened to him. Everybody was making jokes about it, and then all of a sudden it happened, and it was like if you would have been paying attention, you know, we all kind of made it happen, and. I don't know. He definitely lays out that case for sure in the in a part of the movie where he lays out the case like he was going to win the whole time, guys. You guys forget about certain parts yeah, of the country. And, and, you know, he talks about the way that uh, Bernie got screwed at the convention, which he did. And, and it's still kind of weird. Like, uh, we all kind of looked the other way because we were all kind of laughing at Trump. But they they literally, like, they were changing the votes on the floor. Like the entirety, like like uh, I think it, one example was Delaware. Delaware clearly went to Bernie Sanders, but then suddenly on the floor, there's the lady announcing Delaware pledges its delegates to Hillary Clinton, and everybody's looking around. Everybody in the you can see people behind her going, "What are you talking about? She didn't win." <laughs> and she's like, "Yeah, that's who our delegates went to." Yeah, I'm but sad. Let's move to something else. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't do a very good job either of you know. Getting us any further? Who, Bernie? No, yeah, he's a big part of the well, problem. Especially too. when he he just kind of gave up, and I mean, it's him announcing Vermont's delegates go to Hillary Clinton, even though they went to him. <laughs> All right, let's move to something more uplifting: life itself. <laughs> this is rather weirdly uplifting in a way, in a way of like, you ever see somebody like 
just reaching just a little bit too far and falling flat on their face. And, you know, he's like, you appreciate the effort that went into it. Like, you know, man, that was pretty amazing what you tried to do there. That's kind of how I feel about Dan Fogelman and and life itself, because I like his show, This Is Us. I'm a fan. I think it's a really cool show. And it's because he has 24 solid hours to where he can stretch out all these big emotional beats over. And so it's not all within this two-hour frame that you've got to get in all the emotional beats of everyone's life in this movie, which is basically what he tries to do. Uh, there are five chapters to this film, and the, we start with the chapter for Will, uh, played by Oscar Isaac, who's a, a a writer or screenwriter. I'm not sure they're very vague on that, but we see him writing a screenplay to start the movie. And initially, I thought I walked into the wrong movie, because the first thing you hear in this film is narration from Samuel L. Jackson that is totally in a different universe. Like, I literally, it would have been more at home in Assassination Nation hearing Samuel L. Jackson's voice as the narrator. And I thought for a minute, until I saw Annette Bening, I'm like, am I, did I walk into Assassination Nation, or am I actually in life itself? And I had to actually look at IMDb first to see if Samuel L. Jackson was in it on my phone. It's like, okay, Samuel L. Jackson is in this movie. Briefly, <laughs> then Annette Bening gets hit by a bus, and I'm like, "What the hell? Where? What is happening in this movie?" And then Oscar Isaac wakes up out of his fantasy and freaks out in a coffee shop and yells out this like Amazon.com customer review of a Bob Dylan record as he's leaving. <laughs> like, that's the level of insight and, and gravity that this scene has. Uh, we cut to him going to see his therapist, who is Annette Bening, which is why he put her in front of the bus, I guess. And there's another reason why he put her in front of the bus, but that's a spoiler. Um, but basically, his wife, according to him, has left him, and it's turned it sent him crazy. He went to a sanitarium for a while, and now he's out, and uh, he's still kind of a danger to himself. He's suicidal. He's weird. And um, cut to... Uh, other story with uh, a girl who happens to be his daughter. Uh, he's no longer around. The mom's no longer around. She's a punk singer, uh, but she's also like Bob Dylan as well. I don't know. Anyway, she's missing her parents and rebelling. And uh, then there's this next story with Antonio Banderas and this couple who live on his olive farm and he begins to fall in love with the wife and the wife is trying to stay with her husband but he's become kind of an alcoholic because the family's gone through this weird tragedy thing that's related back to the initial tragedy that Will is feeling and then it all coalesces in that kind of crash collateral damage sort of <laughs> weird we're all connected in the universe thing so basically every character gets hit by a bus <laughs> <laughs> either metaphorical or real yes <laughs> I hate this movie. It's terrible. This is a terrible movie. But at the same time, it's the kind of terrible that is just like, you know, you really hung your balls out there, man. Like, you tried something big and bold and dangerous. You failed. <laughs> yeah, put your balls away. <laughs> you, you failed. Like, you slammed into the wall hard. And you're not coming back from that. But you put it out there, buddy. You tried. <laughs> Yeah, and luckily, I don't think anybody's career is going to hurt too bad from this, and because he's got a successful TV series. Sure, he's and been, yeah, Oscar Isaac can do Isaac, Isaac to oh, anything, but this movie kind of just disappeared. It does already. make him look bad. It does really. I mean, like the movie really makes him look bad. Yeah, and I don't he's know. a good actor, and he's forced to do some really stupid, stupid things by this plot. Well, that's. I mean, it could have been. It could be great acting that just a director makes look foolish, and that's a shame. Yeah, and that's pretty much what happens to everybody in this movie. And the problem with TV is, or I guess not the problem, but the easy thing about TV is, like you were saying, you have 24 hours. You can have a bad, you could fuck up for two hours. You still got that, you know, three or four episodes <laughs> later to make up for it. You can have a couple bad episodes, and it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But in a movie, if you... <laughs> He's trying to jam like every big emotional revelation. You know, a character gets cancer, uh, which I call pretty cancer because it's all that pancake makeup and that really cute uh, scarf she gets to wear on her head. <laughs> so she's got pretty cancer. Uh, it, then it, you know another character becomes an alcoholic because it serves the plot, and then the uh, just nonsense ending. Assassination Nation. 
Yeah, Assassination Nation. Uh, this is uh, interesting, I guess. The idea here is kind of Mean Girls meets The Purge, which they pretty much they have that idea and then they pretty much stop. Uh, the idea here is that there's four girls. Uh, they're bitchy and and, and kind of you know I don't want to call them slutty. I mean they they are they're free with their sexuality. They they don't really have any. They don't really care what anybody thinks of them sexually, which is cool. I dig it. Good. Be you. That's what we always wanted. But uh, people are kind of down on them for being you know they kind of call them slutty. I guess. Anyway, there there's this thing going on in the background where somebody has been hacking. Uh, phones and releasing everybody's information, and uh, it happens to this conservative mayor first, where he's exposed as a uh, 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 a guy who fetishizes wearing women's clothes. Uh, then it happens to the school principal, who's not a bad guy, but everybody t- kind of takes all of his stuff and they take it out of context. So he's got like a picture of his, a cute picture of his kid in the bathtub, and everybody goes, "Oh, you're a fucking pedophile because you've got a picture on your phone of your kid in the bathtub. Clearly, you're a pedophile." And so he, they, they try to run him out of town, and then it happens to half the town, and then suddenly somebody links it to her. Meanwhile, she's carrying on an affair with a character who she calls Daddy, uh, who is this kind of older adult man. Uh, and when his stuff gets hacked, obviously her pictures come out, and people figure out who she is and the lead character. And... Then it turns into a whole purge thing where they've got to fuck – like everybody thinks that she released all this stuff and uh, she, she and her friends have got to t- take up arms and fight back. And the idea here, I guess, is kind of like a Me Too revenge fantasy. But it's it, kind of what it sounds like. It, well, that's, that's the idea, but it, the movie is so facile and so, and so limited in that idea that it just pretty, pretty much presents that idea. And if you want to bring that to it, you can – but the movie really doesn't have it. It doesn't really have it down. It really is kind of faking towards that. It's a very uh, – it, it has a lot of ideas, but it doesn't have a lot of depth. It's a, really a puddle depth on, the, on those ideas because really they're more interested in shooting the guns than they are actually saying anything about why they're shooting guns. So what is your take on the Me Too now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, uh, Movie Pass really wanted us to see this, and I got a message, uh, an alert, in fact, halfway through the week, saying, "All right, you asked for it, and you're getting it." Assassination Nation. I'm like, I did. I don't remember asking for it. Is there? Is it a particular, like? Is it stylish to a point where you can imagine this becoming a cult type of film? Maybe. I mean, it. But it also, you know, I mean. We've seen this movie before in terms of the look. We saw Spring Breakers, which is the better version of this movie, honestly. <laughs> like, at least that movie... I mean, that movie's kind of lazy and kind of all over the place, but it's also, you know, the the very similar idea. Uh, and, and it looks like a Harmony Korean movie. Like, he's definitely stealing... All, a lot of the visuals of this movie is coming from Spring Breakers. Just in pink instead of, you know, the, the, the sunny colors that he's got. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I could definitely see where somebody's going to be inspired to, you know, say like this movie is speaking to me in that way, but I, I didn't find it deep enough to, to really, it, it, the ideas it presents are far more interesting than the ideas it actually has. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event for the linear, legitimate, and universally recognized undisputed classic all right well we'll move on to our classic school of rock no i'm sorry <laughs> that's what i watched this week <laughs> just <kidding>. retrospect <laughs> <laughs> oh i found a bus balls galaxy quest <laughs> oh the reason we picked galaxy quest is grills of the mist grills in the mist uh turned 30 this week that was a big sigourney weaver movie uh, I think she got nominated for an Oscar Indeed for Indeed she did. Uh, Galaxy Quest is a movie we all like, as far as I know, and haven't really talked about, kind of mentioned, but never really talked about on the show. Yeah, and, and my choice for it really came from um, all of the conversations over the past year or so at home that I've had about, oh, I really, you, you love Galaxy Quest, I love it too. Well, I'd only seen it once in the theater, and that's all the way back in 1999, so my memory's a little hazy of it at this point, and then... With when you get so much talking up about it, you you start to uh, fetishize the idea that this is just as good as you're being told. 
and I've done a lot with Star Trek in the past five years or so. I, I've really reinvested myself into that franchise. So seeing something that plays off of that seemed very desirable. And Sigourney Weaver's in it. That sounds great, right? And Alan Rickman doing his thing. Going back to it this week, though, I had my son watch it with me. Uh, okay. There's a lot of enjoyable singular moments and inside jokes if you're a Trek fan uh, or a fan of any kind of genre stuff that you can identify. If, if you're a fan of Alan Rickman, I suppose. If you're a fan of uh, Tim Allen doing his thing, right, then he kind of you know gets some moments here. Uh, if you're a fan of Odd Talking Aliens, okay, you've got your moment here too. The problem, I guess, is that I didn't laugh as much as I expected to, and I I wish I would have. And another problem is the the special effects in this movie, while maybe wanting to be bad because of what it's spoofing, which is early Star Trek, they're really bad. Like, this is the worst special effects that I can ever remember seeing. And I kind of, it, it took me back to my memory in 1999 of this movie. And there's a reason why I don't own this one. It, there has to be, because if I like something that much, I like, I like to have it on the shelf with me too, so I can watch it any time. I didn't have this, and that told me I didn't get past that point. It's, it's true, and I, I remember thinking in the theater, boy, these special effects are really terrible. It's fun, and, and if you like Star Trek, great. Uh, Sigourney Weaver is kind of uh, out of character here is is a, for a lack of a better term, a, a bimbo on screen. And she's playing somebody that literally her only job is to repeat something that somebody else said to the computer. Normally, Sigourney Weaver has a lot to do, and so I understand why she took the role. Uh, but I didn't laugh as much as I hoped I would, and I feel bad saying this, but... You know, it's not a classic for for sure. I agree, it's not a classic. But I, I did laugh more than you did, though. Uh, <laughs> uh, I I don't know. It's something about Tony Shalhoub's really like yeah, lazy yeah. line readings got me. Uh, seeing Rain Wilson, the very young Rain Wilson, made me laugh. Uh, uh, Alan Rickman's constant just kind of bitchiness got me, and and even I didn't I didn't hate Tim Allen completely, which I usually do outside of the Toy Story movies. I usually pretty much hate Tim Allen anything he does, but uh, he's he's good good enough here. But and also with that, I'd imagine none of us are big Tim Allen fans outside of the Toy Story movies. Yeah, Home, mm-hmm. I watched Home Improvement. I watched but... it too, but with that kind of not really. Being an Alan Rickman fan and then having his bitchiness with Tim Allen, it really does kind of make that work even better. Because <laughs> it really is Tim the Tool Man Taylor in Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. 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 He, I mean, he's not doing Shatner, so that's good, I guess. You know, he's, it's, he's, he's only, just doing Tim Allen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's really not much effort going on here. But it, but it kind of works. And, you know, the story is very uh, mainstream and very predictable but you know predictable and, a, and at least it's colorful and kind of uh it's got a personality so I, I dig that and i did like i said i laughed a lot it's a fun good movie but i'm kind of with you josh where it's when i go to those fun movies i watch over and over again this isn't one of them yes and it's like the step below that you know my cousin Vinny's movie i've watched a million times over you know jane sound a lot of the kevin smith movies i watch repeatedly uh, this is one that I, it's, you know, I remember liking it. Every time I go back, I like it, but I, I've gone back twice. <laughs> yeah. So it's hard to, it, it's hard to kind of hold it to that level. I, I think more than anything, it's Alan Rickman and me wanting to like it even more because he's in it. But <laughs> really, if you want to go Alan Rickman, go to Die Hard or Dogma. <laughs> right. Or, or even Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, because of the the I've gone back over to the that top. More. I'd like to say this is better than that, but you're right. I have gone back to piece <laughs> more than I've gone back to this. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm feeling bad by saying this, but boy, it really didn't engage us. Uh, it, it engaged one person at home, but not as hard as I had hoped that it would. You know, it wasn't a big success, but at least we've talked about it now and. Now I've moved through a lot of things that I feel obligated to cover. No, I couldn't get anybody in my family to watch it with me. <laughs> my wife's like, that piece of shit? I'm like, you've never seen it. She's like, yes, I have. I'm like, we were dating then. I didn't watch it with you, and I know you haven't seen it. What's it about? I don't know. I'm just not going to watch it. <laughs> so, 
See, I feel like that is the attitude of most people that think even about stuff like Star Trek. They're either going to be like, oh, well, that sounds mildly interesting, or I'm not even watching it. What's it about? I don't know. I, it sounds terrible. Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. So, And I, I will say the reason I've even seen this movie is because of just word of mouth, because I, I am the guy that's like, yeah, screw it, Star yeah, Trek. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the fact that people, you know, what's his name? The, oh, my God. The one I like the most in this movie, besides Alan Rickman, the guy who was a nameless character, Sam, Sam, Rockwell. Sam Rockwell. Yes, he's great in this movie. <laughs> yeah, at this point in 1999, <laughs> I didn't know who in the world Sam Rockwell was. So seeing him in this movie, I'm like, it's Sam Rockwell. I didn't realize he was in this one because then I had no idea who in the world he was. If, I mean, and think about Rain Wilson. You know, it's like I imagine this is one of his first three movies, probably almost famous. You know, he had. You know, love it or hate it, House of a Thousand Corpses is now a cult classic. And then this, which has its own little audience, that's kind of a nice <laughs> start of a career. Oh, yeah. It hasn't really done anything since Dwight. Anything else on Galaxy Quest before we move on? Not a classic, but no. it's okay. All right. Before we get to 88, let's just do our top five, and then we can jump right into Grills and the Mists. Put your top five. Who's your top five? We will start with Uncle Jeff. Or no, we'll start with Cousin Jeff, sorry. He had Eyewitness, Cabin in the Woods, Aliens, Copycat, and Alien. Ian Britt had five Avatar, four Ghostbusters, two, three Aliens, two Ghostbusters, one Alien. Uncle Jeff just said, I'm not a Sigourney Weaver fan. (laughs) Uh, So he had number one, Annie Hall, two Baby Mama, three Copycat, four The Ice Storm, five Working Girl. And then Josh had like a green throw up face underneath his comment. <laughs> well, it was more of like a, I was nauseated by the comments because I, I thought I felt bad, right? But eh, it inspired some conversation. That was some good stuff. <laughs> of uh, course, he has a, by all means, have your opinion. My God, Meryl Streep is clearly like a more well known, better body of work actress than, than Sigourney Weaver. That's totally fine. It, it, I understand that Sigourney Weaver is more of a personal, like, choice and could she Meryl's, plays my favorite character. Could Meryl Streep be Dana Barrett or Ripley? <laughs> well. No. No. <laughs> Not really. Ripley maybe. Maybe in yeah the first for one and a half movies maybe. There you go. Because she wouldn't make the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> You're all Uncle Jeff for me. <laughs> <laughs> Christina Cato had number five Avatar, four Aliens, three Galaxy Quest, two Ghostbusters, one Cabin in the Woods. Uh, Domi Self said there's no Dana, there's only Zool. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, what, let's see here. I went to MrSkin.com and just put the fun <laughs> yeah. Did you really? <laughs> wow. But now my real top five is now hidden and I can't see it. But what, it's, do you, what, you have a subscription or something? <laughs> no, I just... <laughs> We're all aware there's a website called MrSkin.com. We just type your name in there, and it shows every movie she's been. He might have a bathroom book, you know. I don't have that anymore. <laughs> there we go. I returned it. But uh, it's basically the two ghost. I like the two Ghostbusters movies. Uh, I like Alien more than Aliens. And then Cabin in the Woods. I feel like I'm missing one more in there. Uh, let me see here real quick. I think someone else had it on their list. Or Dave's good. Yeah, I'll just say that's my list. Uh, Josh? Yeah, looking back, she (laughs) hasn't really had a ton of great movies, but she's just been really good in a lot of them that have kind of been in the the ether, you know, film-wise for the past 35, 40 years. My top five, and I I watched um, Peter Weir's Year of Living Dangerously this week, and Peter Weir... It's just an incredible director. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't done something that I've disliked thus far. And that movie was very good. Uh, And she was good in it, too. But she wasn't in it very much. So it's not going to use her number five for me, which is A Monster Calls. And four is Dave. Three, Ghostbusters. Two, Alien. And number one is Aliens, of course. But she's done some other stuff that's really interesting. Like The Ice Storm is a really good movie that came out like one of Fox Searchlight's uh, first releases or whatever and snow white a tale of terror like i don't know if any of you have seen that one but it's actually really quality it's gross it's like 
Snow White turned on its head, and it, it, it's really dark and gothic. I liked it, but I've actually enjoyed her mostly in movies where she's not like there very often, and that's not a commentary on her acting, but she makes smart choices for cameos. So, like Cabin in the Woods, she makes an amazing cameo. She's barely in Wall-E, but she makes an impression in Wall-E as the ship's computer. Um, Be Kind Rewind, very small performance, but uh, she's she's really funny in a couple moments, and she really pushes Jack Black and, and most Def along in that film, and I liked that. Um, I, obviously, you know, I hate the Avatar movies, so that, that would be on the opposite uh, list. But uh, I guess there's the, if I had one that stands out outside that, Outside of the typical, you know, Ghostbusters pick, I would have to say, uh, uh, I mean, maybe Tadpole is, is a pretty good movie that people have not heard much about. Or, um, and obviously, I think Working Girl may be the best work of her career. We'll be coming up on that here in just a couple of months as it turns 30. Yeah, and we've always we've kind of always made jokes about her being like a mother figure to Josh. And to yeah, me, yeah. she's always kind of been that. My friend's hot mom. On- <laughs> <laughs> I have run into so much dangerous territory with Sigourney Weaver because I've never seen her like that at all. It's always been, if you looked at pictures of my mom in the eighties, like she even had hair, kind of like um, Sigourney's in in Alien. Uh, so I guess she was out of style in theory then. But anyways, uh, she really bore a resemblance to her jawline and everything like that. And so I, I grew up thinking that my mom was kind of a movie star, you know, based on the on the resemblance there. Now Sigourney Weaver's like eight inches taller than my mom was, but still. I do think part of that comes from my my dad didn't really like her. Like he liked the alien movies and liked Ghostbusters, yeah. but he was very much a Christian. And so the fact that, like, when she went on Saturday Night Live, when that was a Half Moon Street or whatever that yes. was called, when that came out, she went on Saturday Night Live and was like, I'm naked in the movie, go see it. <laughs> and I don't think my dad ever saw the movie, but he saw her say that, and he was like, you know what, fuck her the rest of every time she was in a movie. So I think a little is bit that, of that. Is that a weird Oedipal thing for you? Can you watch that movie, Josh? Half Moon Street? <laughs> we made him watch it, remember? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, right. I, I saw it. <laughs> Um, I remember being uncomfortable, and I said that during the episode. Right. Like, I think we titled weird. the podcast like Josh sees his mom naked. Or something. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like that's that. right. That's right. Yeah. Well, I haven't been sleeping much lately, so my memory's not good. Well, it was a long time ago. Not, not, number not, 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 number eighteen in nineteen eighty-eight. Squeezed and pulled and hurt my neck in nineteen eighty-eight. Squeezed and pulled and hurt your neck in nineteen eighty-eight. But uh, nineteen eighty-eight. Gorillas in the Mist did come out along with other movies. Let's start there. Indeed. And, and I didn't watch Gorillas in the Mist this week. I really wanted to, but I watched uh, an hour-long movie on YouTube instead that you'll hear eventually. Uh, it's a movie about Diane Fossey, who was an activist for gorillas. Um, and the reason why this one's important to me, and I'll make it very brief, it's not so much the movie itself, which is a fine biopic, it involves her struggle with trying to preserve something whilst other parties involved didn't like what she was doing because it infringed on their possibilities for making money. Um, and she was killed for it. Now, I did not know as a, as a child, as a 10-year-old, when I saw this movie, what happened to Diane Fossey. So as I'm going through this movie and watching somebody that looks like my mother act as this wonderful activist for gorillas and whatnot, this, the movie doesn't even show her being murdered. It just shows that she has died. And I, as a kid, was confused by that. And I looked at my mom and I said, what? What's happened? And this idea that in the world people would kill you for doing something right was mind-boggling. And so this movie had a strong effect on me as a youngster. Now, it earned her an Academy Award nomination. But it, it overall, I think, is a very standard biopic based on my memory. Very true. That's uh, completely accurate. It's very staid, very professional, kind of dull. <laughs> um. Not badly acted, but, you know, just kind of there. It is a little bit of homework, I guess. Yeah. I do, like, this is kind of the movie where I remember that conversation with my dad, because my mom loved this movie, and that was her, I had to listen to him be like, you're watching that piece of crap, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so it was just kind of, this is kind of that movie that 
really <laughs> pulled it all together for me, which is not, it's not like it's a sexy performance at all. It's not. Right, exactly. <laughs> and and w- nothing's going to draw somebody in that's like a, a, a blockbuster watcher, like a title like Gorillas in the Mist. You know, it just doesn't speak to something that you would really get into seeing. But it was a successful film, and, and people do, I think, remember it on a lower level. What else did we have in 88? Uh, I'm going to go with the Cronenberg movie next. And boy, did I really want to watch this. And I think I'll take some time this week to go back and watch it called Dead Ringers. And Cronenberg is an interesting director to me. There's the history of violence Cronenberg. And then there's the fly Cronenberg. I think there's altered states Cronenberg in there as well, which I wasn't crazy about that one. And I considered it for a classic just to see what we all thought of it. But Dead Ringers stars Jeremy Irons and he plays twins that are both gynecologists and they try and uh, weave each other within each other's lives to try and obviously do the nefarious things that you would imagine based on what I've just said. But they fall in love with the same woman played by Genevieve Buhold or Bujold, or I'm not sure how you pronounce her last name, but it is such a dark idea uh, of, and how you would work that into a film, I'm not sure. But I know that it is, it's something that people have really considered to be a, a well-done performance by Jeremy Irons. And he is someone that I'm drawn to. And I, I admire Cronenberg for, if nothing else, always wanting to explore a macabre idea. I find it to be lesser, Cronenberg, in terms of... Because uh, he's very all over the place in, in his uh, work and... This is on the lower end of of his uh, stuff. Not he's never bad. I don't. Well, maybe. I wasn't a big fan of Eraserhead, I guess. But uh, it was Lynch was or it? Lynch. Sorry, that's I keep mixing those two up. Uh, that's because I don't get much sleep. Uh, <laughs> no, the, the, this is this is on the lower end of his of his stuff. But Jeremy uh, Jeremy Irons does stand out. He does create sort of a a very creepy uh, pair of characters that are that are memorable, but. The movie itself isn't particularly memorable. Yeah, I'm not. Like, I, I I think I've only really seen The History of Violence and Eastern Promises. Then I tried to watch one of it, like he did something with Robert Pattinson that was just kind of all over the place. Uh, but I'm not, I mean, I've seen The Fly, but other than that, like, I haven't seen Altered States. I, I haven't seen this. Uh, some of those other ones he's done in the 80s. Uh, I feel like we need to, at some point, maybe <laughs> invest a little into his career, because I, I need to catch up. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the the other interesting thing about Cronenberg is I've always had it in the back of my head where they approached him about doing the fourth Alien film because of his gothic mindset and whatnot and what he would want to do with a character that was kind of ambiguous. Okay, obviously the movie's completely screwed up, but I've always had it in my head. What would a Cronenberg Alien movie be like as a result? Probably so the same as it was, because they, <laughs> they just take it over anyway and lose the director's <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I guess I'll lose that idea. Uh, but also in 88, uh, really quickly, I'll go through Spellbinder with Tim Daly and Kelly Preston. A young lawyer, after falling in love with a beautiful woman, finds that he has, she has an extremely mysterious past. Great she, movie. Really? Oh, wait, Kelly Preston. I think we're going back to the Mr. Skin book again. Oh, I'm not positive I've seen this one. Uh, all right, I understand now. Uh, a movie called Kansas, starring Matt Dillon and Andrew McCarthy, an odd pairing, but a young man returning home to attend a wedding hooks up with a drifter who turns out to be a violent bank robber. Before he knows it, the man finds himself involved in the robber's plans. All right, interesting. Um, Andrew McCarthy, just as an 80s actor, I had an, a thought that I might want to watch this. but yeah. This is like one of his first stabs at playing adult roles coming out of those... John Hughes movies and yeah yeah it, it's so awkward so like it's last year really less than awkward. zero yeah. it was a little awkward in and then this one okay. this one's even more awkward and lastly a movie that has four legitimate names that you know but I've never heard of this movie before <laughs> called Sweetheart's Dance and it has Don Johnson Susan Sarandon Jeff Daniels and Elizabeth Perkins that's quite an 80s trio or a quartet there for you I don't know what a trio is apparently anymore <laughs> but um involving a couple that's been married for years and are in the process of breaking up and adults having conflicting emotions and evaluating their relationship. Blah, 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 blah. No one knows what the hell that's this is. That's a random is. quartet, too. You know, you think of those four together. You, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's just four people you would never think of in the same sentence. Yeah, I guess Don Johnson's <laughs> charm with Susan Sarandon. Okay, sure, but 
Jeff Daniels and Elizabeth Perkins? That doesn't seem to fit very well. I don't know. Right. I don't know. I haven't seen it, so whatever. Maybe it's great. <laughs> uh, but that's 88, right? That's yes. That's everything. So next week, I believe we're going to hell, as Sean likes to say. <laughs> yes. So we're going In honor home. of Hellfest. We're going home. <laughs> Uh, Hellfest comes out, Night School, and Smallfoot. Uh, our classic's going to be From Hell, mm-hmm. Johnny Depp movie. And then our top five is top five movies about hell. Yes. Uh, so, it can be hell in the title or just about hell in general. or you know, Yeah, just find it how you like. Just involve hell. Yeah, make sure you don't forget hell. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, uh, so we'll get that out there on our social media sites, Critics Pod on Instagram and Twitter. We're also on Facebook. Like us, friend us. Uh, please go to Apple Podcasts, subscribe to the show, rate, rate and review the show. If you are a Patreon supporter, we do have the merch, and I'm ready to send it out to everybody who's eligible, uh, which is pretty much everyone. I think I got mugs for everybody at the $10 level and up. I think that's about how it goes. And then bumper stickers and magnets for the, everybody else. Uh, we got the bonus episode out there. Uh, that's not really a bonus. You're getting an early release. Uh, but from there, let's thank our Patreon supporters. Let's start with our key grip level in Charlie Messing. <laughs> our character actors, Josh and Christina. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Our special effect level, Corey. May the force be with you. Our associate producer, Jason from New Mexico. Everybody has to eat shaving cream once in a while. And our movie stars, Dave Seavers and Uncle Jeff. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! If you want to be a Patreon supporter, I hate critics.net slash Patreon. It's the best way to help support the podcast. Uh, like I said, like us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and subscribe to the show and tell your friends about it. Uh, if you like, if you're new to the show, go back and listen to some of our old episodes. We have an undisputed classic link at I hate critics.net. Uh, we can listen to any podcast where we talk about a movie you might want to hear. So I guess that's it. We'll see you next week. That ought to do it. Thanks very much, Ray. And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. We're the three best friends that anyone can have. And we'll never, ever, 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 ever leave each other. We're the best three friends that anybody could have. I mean, the three best friends that anybody could have. The friends that You guys want to play flick chart or are you burnt? I'm ready. Yeah, I'm all for it. All right. Patch Adam, they're about a boy. About a boy. About a boy. <laughs> really? <laughs> the Emperor's New Groove or Rear Window? Rear Window. Rear Window. Starsky and Hutch or The Hunt for Red October? Starsky and Hutch. Hunt for Red October? I'll go with the Hunt for October just for the eating scenes. <laughs> Rocky Four or the Indian in the Cupboard? Rocky Four. Rocky Four. Godzilla, 98, or Trading Places, 83? Trading Places. Trading Places. Happy Gilmore or Desperado? Desperado. Fishing with God. <laughs> no, oh, yeah, Desperado. Like Desperado. Yeah. Overrated? Hi. Yeah, absolutely. That's the right word. Uh, the Fugitive or Chronicles of Riddick? Ooh, I like Chronicles of Riddick a lot. You do? <sighs> Chronicles of Riddick is awesome. awesome. Yeah. I'm the one who doesn't like one of them. What was it, Pitch Black? Was that the first one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't a big fan of Pitch Black, but Chronicles of Riddick is kind of badass. Yeah, but In that kind of same sort of dumb, sort of Fast and Furious kind of way. Uh, what were the choices? <laughs> the fugitive. <laughs> the fugitive. Yeah, it's the fugitive. <laughs> fugitive, indeed. Road trip or Mrs. Doubtfire? Road trip. <laughs> Mrs. Doubtfire. It's Mrs. Doubtfire. That's parts of road trip I like. Lethal Weapon 4 or Mystic River? Mystic River. Mystic River. 
Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1 or Stardust? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Glory or Basic Instinct? Glory. <laughs> Glory. Yeah. Fantasia, 1940, or Zack and Mary make a porn? <laughs> Zack and Mary. <laughs> yeah, I still haven't seen Zack and Mary. I need to watch that so that I can answer the damn <laughs> Fletcher question. <laughs> it pops up way too much. <laughs> Ray Dink? What the hell? Yeah, I'd probably just skip it, whatever that is. Goodfellas or Caddyshack, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> Fishing with Gandhi. No. Goodfellas is the clear the winner there. <laughs> Fishing with Gandhi. Every movie fan just pissed off at you right now. <laughs> These two classic movies, and you're picking Fishing with Gandhi. Crocodile Dundee or Stargate? <laughs> <laughs> Fishing with Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> Crocodile Dundee. That's got that one didn't hold up as much as I'd hoped when it turned thirty and whatnot. But I mean, it's got some heart to it. Paul Hogan or Kurt Russell? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Paul Hogan versus Roland Emmerich. <laughs> that that's the problem. <laughs> I was trying to make the argument to my brother this week that Sigourney Weaver is kind of the Kurt Russell of, on the female side. Oh, absolutely. He's like, absolutely not. She was, <laughs> her movies were box, they're more mainstream, and the, she, and he was more, he kind of, I don't know, he just had more of a cult following for a while, and then, I don't he tried to say Elizabeth Shue. I'm like, well, she didn't make good movies, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, my argument would be with you, though. I, the genre hero on either, and then either side. People came back and started hiring her for things like Cabin in the Woods, like yeah. they did him for certain things. Captain Ron. Exactly. <laughs> Heat or The Truman Show? <laughs> the Truman Show. Oh, man. I'm going Heat. I, yeah, it's Heat. I mean, I know the Truman Show is good. I just, I like Heat that much. The Adventures of Tintin or Cars? Cars. Adventures of Tintin. I'm going to go Cars. Cool Runnings or The Sword in the Stone, 1963? Cool Runnings. Cool Runnings. Robin Hood Men in Tights or The Crow? The Crow. The Crow. We need to bring that to the show at some point. Meet the Parents or X-Men The Last Stand? Meet the Parents. Meet the Parents. <laughs> Does that surprise you guys? That no. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this might. Alien Resurrection or Freaky Friday? <laughs> Freaky Friday. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask which one it is. It's Freaky Friday. <laughs> the Lindsay one. Lohan one. <laughs> this is pretty easy, but it's still a good one. Arrival or Death Proof? Ooh, that is good. Uh, Arrival is the obvious answer, but Death Proof is a hell of a movie. Arrival. I agree. As good as it gets are planes, trains, and automobiles. Oh, geez. Uh, as good as it gets. Planes, trains, and automobiles. I'll go as good as it gets. But again, I think we need to bring that to the show again so I can get a refresher. <laughs> the further I get away from it, the more I just kind of think of not being that good. Serenity or The Simpsons movie? Ooh, that's tough. Uh, uh, Simpsons. That is tough. Uh, gosh. <laughs> a TV show made into movies, like that would be in the top five, I think, for both of them, but I'll go Simpsons movie. Good, because I haven't seen Serenity, so I shouldn't. <laughs> All right, Kill Bill Volume 2 or Alice in Wonderland, the Kill Tim Bill. Burton version. Kill Bill. All right, last one, The Day After Tomorrow or Tommy Boy. Tommy boy. Tommy boy. 